Hi everyone, I'm Summer. I'm Carrie. And this is Popsia Podcast. I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, don't be nervous, don't be shy. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh my god! What the hell just happened? <laughs> what the hell? What is happening? <laughs> um, make sure you come back. We're gonna do this bi-weekly. So make sure you come back to talk to, to us more about you know, sex, drugs, and self-improvement. <laughs> we are back today with For Honest History with Leo, our favorite historian and Ninja Turtle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that okay that I called you a Ninja Turtle? I mean, I grew up with it in elementary school, so like, I by this time, I'm right? I'm pretty well versed in it. I'm good. I, I loved Ninja Turtles. I, I used to have a turtle and I named him Leo. So. Um, I mean, I walk around with a Ninja Turtle pack everywhere and the kids at work love me for it. So. Oh, really? Oh, that's so cute. I want one of those. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm a child, obviously. <laughs> I'm wearing antlers today um, because I am evolving into my final form as Dear Woman. <laughs> Which, if you don't know the story of Dear Woman, it means you haven't watched Reservation Dogs, and you should fix that. But in our stories, Dear Lady brought justice to bad men. Basically, she killed men who uh, abused women. But I felt like it was appropriate, since we're uh, the subject we're talking about today, you know, bringing justice to bad men is something that needs to happen more often in this world. Agreed. So, Leo, tell us about Thanksgiving. Just jumping right in, huh? Jump right in. Let's go. <laughs> All like, about Thanksgiving. Around the book. I mean, first off, like I, I try not to even call it Thanksgiving. I call it Turkey Day just because it's, okay. it's, it's, not it's not the greatest holiday in the world, obviously, as we know. Um, but I think for, for all the listeners and, and all the millions of people that are across America, like, you know, tons of people across America have, have like, unfortunately participated in, in some sort of, you know, reenactment of Thanksgiving and the first feast and all that sort of stuff in elementary school, whether you were, you know, a pilgrim or you were, you know, an indigenous person and that whole sort of thing. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, and almost anybody can almost tell you, like, the basic retelling of, you know, Turkey Day and Thanksgiving. Um, but unfortunately, like, most of what they know is completely dead wrong. And uh, that's not on accident. It's, uh, it's meant to be wrong on purpose. Um, Thanksgiving itself is, is like th one of the earliest forms of, of American propaganda in history. Um, and for those who don't necessarily know propaganda, but it's basically um, purposeful um, language in order to, to get a point across. Um, and when it comes to a lot of that day, like so much of it is, is myth um, and just flat out lies that you almost have to retell it from the from the beginning all the way through in order to make sure that like you get an accurate portrayal of it. Um, starting off with like the pilgrims in and of themselves. I mean, they get to what we know today as, as Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, but what most people don't realize is that they were not actually meant to go there. Uh, they were actually meant to sail to Jamestown of Virginia, um, but they got lost. And so they ended up like 2000 miles northern more northern than what they'd ever even thought that they would be. But they thought they were getting to Jamestown so they could go hang out with, I guess, John Smith and John Rolfe and the rest of them folks. Um, and we kind of- So know getting them. lost seems to be like a common thing that happened with a lot of these early folks. <laughs> it's thing. Like they thought they were somewhere else and it weren't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that all actually, I mean, if we want to go even further, like, that all, that goes all the way back to, like, the, the 1500s with uh, Hernan Cortez and Francisco Pizarro, like, going to what we know today as the Aztec Empire and the Inca Empire, um, and they came back with tons of gold, and so when other explorers came across the Atlantic Ocean, we call them explorers loosely. Um, I call they them thought that they, Exactly, I call them exploiters. Um, but when they came across the Atlantic Ocean and they hit any land, they all thought that they were in that same magical place and that they could just magically just, you know, dig in the ground and get gold. And lo and behold, there really was none on the East Coast of the United States or, you know, then before the United States. Um, but that's what they thought they were getting. And if anybody's ever even seen like the, the Disney movie Pocahontas, like even at the beginning of that, like there's actually some, some decent stuff in there. Like literally when they, as soon as they, they hit ground in Jamestown, the first thing the guy tells them to do is start digging for gold. And that's literally what they did. Um, it wasn't until later on that they realized that they didn't have it. But let's get back to the pilgrims. So they got lost. 
they got lost. And um, another myth about the pilgrims is that they were not leaving Europe because they were being persecuted for their religion. They actually left Europe because they didn't want to pay taxes in order to practice a religion in other European countries. Um, so yeah, they left England for that purpose. But when they settled in other places in Northern Europe, um, they were allowed to live there and practice whatever religion they wanted to, but they had to pay a fee to the king. And they decided they didn't want to do that a couple of different times, which is why they left in the first place. But, is um, this why churches <laughs> still aren't taxed? <laughs> That's probably another topic for another day. <laughs> I'm going to let y'all handle that one. <laughs> uh, I was just doing research on that recently, and I realized that that's like the, the least regulated tax shelter in existence in this country. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell us what's wrong with the uh, story that we were taught in third grade about the first Thanksgiving. Tons. Um, let's see, to start off with, um, you know, the story of indigenous history in America tends to always start off like at this point in time when, you know, Jamestown and the pilgrims make contact with indigenous peoples. But um, it's really important for us to understand and to center the idea that like indigenous peoples have been here on Turtle Island for at least the last 12,000 years. So really only picking up the story in, you know, 1607 or 1619, um, you know, is in 1620 is actually, you know, it does, it does more harm than good in order to do that. And it really does make it seem as if like, there are no indigenous peoples until white people actually get here. And that is completely and patently false. Um, and so recentering it in that way is really important. Um, it's also important to understand that uh, when you, even when you read the story within textbooks, or even when you see like little videos about it, they all end up running into this indigenous person that, that magically speaks English. His name is Squanto. And even when I tell this story to students, even when we read it in a book, um, I ask them, like I stopped them right after that part and asked them like, what sticks out about that to you? None of them ever raise their hand and say, you know what, that seems out of place. Like we just automatically assume that like somehow English is like the standard language all across the world and it is not. But we never bother thinking about like, damn, like how the hell did Squanto even know English? And that's because like the people, like the, the, the Wampanoags and, and, and peoples that are around that area had already been um, kidnapped and taken back to Europe quite a few different times. And so there were at least two or three people that were within the Wampanoag nation that actually knew English already. And that wasn't by accident. Um, it's also important to understand that like that first Thanksgiving, which we talk about it being like a friendly feast and that sort of thing, was not really that at all. It wasn't, it wasn't friendly. It was a business deal. It was a business dinner. Uh, when it comes to the Wampanoags and, and, and the Pilgrims, they wanted to, uh, to to form an alliance with the Pilgrims in order to stop, um, you know, their other, you know, rival, like rival tribes from uh, taking their land. And so to them, like that was all about um, setting up an alliance and not actually becoming friends. Um, and that also hopefully throws a, a whole lot of uh, shade at the idea that indigenous peoples were docile and friendly and that sort of thing. Like, you know, it was important that we understand that like they are, are warm groups of people just like lots of other people themselves and that they didn't just give away land. Um, and that even when it comes to these ideas of, of religion and spiritual and nature and the ideas of property that like they still had these sorts of ideas, um, they just differed from the you know, European idea. And so therefore they were looked down upon and they were minimized. Um, even when it comes to the idea of property, like indigenous peoples believe in community property, but not personal property. And that was the same thing that like the English people wanted to, to take. They wanted it to make all these little small parts of the land to create um, personal property in and of itself. Um, after that Thanksgiving, you can really draw a direct line from that, that business dinner all the way through to um, the first major like conflict that indigenous peoples had like, like uh, nationwide. And that would be King Philip's War in uh, 1675. Um, and you can see how fast that alliance between the Pilgrims and the Wampanoag completely deteriorate, even based off of that um, and, and leading back to that area and, and leading back to, to that event. Um, Thanksgiving doesn't become a holiday until the middle of uh, the 16, uh, middle of, of the Civil War in the 1860s because of the great guy, you know, that we call the, the great emancipator Abraham Lincoln. Um, and that's another topic for another day. Yeah, and, we'll need uh, to do that one at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and he created in the middle of the Civil War in order to create some sort of uh, idea of nationalism and patriotism around the, the holiday in and of itself. But even still, he doesn't even really come across that holiday until 
he sees a footnote in a publication by a, a man by the name of Reverend Alexander uh, Young, who uh, wrote about the, the first Thanksgiving being this kind of friendly feast and a day of, of a friendship amongst uh, a, a group of indigenous peoples in the pilgrims. And from there, like the, the myth of itself really does blow up. Um, and Randy, uh, let's not forget they were celebrating the Pequot massacre. Yeah. Like yeah, they they were celebrating that they had went and murdered hundreds of people. Yes, and, and to them, like that was all a part of a day's work. And not only were they celebrating that, but like we've completely forgotten about all these massacres that have happened on this land and in this country um, for the sake of you know peace and for the sake of having a history that people can be proud of. And really, that's what Thanksgiving really does harken back to, especially at its inception. Um, when it is uh, the English and the Protestants in this country that decided to create this holiday because at that point in time in the 1800s, they're getting a really big influx of, uh, you know, European immigrants. They're getting an influx of, of people that are Jewish, that are Irish, that are German, and they're trying their hardest in order to keep their history as Protestant and as Anglican as they possibly can. And so this holiday is meant to, to, to make sure that they will not be replaced. And um, I mean, even that that saying itself and that slogan and that motto, um, we can remember back to Charlottesville in like 2017 with like, you know, people will not replace us. Like we still keep replaying that same idea over and over and over again. It's the um, American way. Yeah, it's about as American as apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the day, and even when it comes to, to Thanksgiving, the way that it, it, it makes indigenous peoples a monolith um, in which, you know, all indigenous peoples are exactly the same. And, and even when you look back at like uh, statues that are that are put up in different places across the East Coast to commemorate uh, Thanksgiving, whether you're talking about at Plymouth or other places like that, um, the statues that they've created are of indigenous leaders that are, you know, all exactly the same way, standing straight up, very stiff. You know, they're wearing moccasins, very little clothing. Um, and it really does, again, really hide in plain sight the lies that are being told. Um, because for indigenous peoples all to be a monolith, how the hell were indigenous people surviving in on the East Coast in yeah. October, in November, in December, in January, in February? Some brutal winter. Bare chested <laughs> and wearing loincloth and wearing little moccasins and wearing headdresses, and that was it. Like, and again, people look at these statues and they and they read the little plaques, and yet and still they don't bother to even take in consideration you know, the lack of common sense that it took to even create that statue in that place that they did. Um, I mean, don't you think that part of that, the reason, part of the reason that people don't question, like, okay, why are they wearing a loincloth in, you know, when, in, when it's going to be cold up north, right, is that we've become, we've been so conditioned in this country to think of indigenous people as primitive and kind of stupid. Yeah. I mean, I know I have people say that directly to me in my community work that that's what they think we are. So, I mean, do you think that kind of feeds into that? Oh, 100%. And, and it, I mean, and it's still the same thing today. I mean, the, the old adage is, is like, if you say something long enough, like it becomes a fact and people believe it. And as long as you keep perpetuating that same idea, you know, in, in, in that same myth, people will begin to think of it as fact. And literally that is what American history is littered with is a bunch of myths in order to make America look good. Um, it's not history in and of itself. Like it's, it's nationalistic propaganda. Um, but yeah, it goes really back to that idea again of, of, you know, did people's being simple, being stupid. Um, you weren't able, you weren't, you weren't strong enough to take hold on to your land. And so, you know, you know, English people took it. I mean, even all the, going back to like the $24 myth, of like being able to, to, to buy Manhattan for $24 and, and yet and still like we don't take in consideration, you know, what that meant or exactly the truth behind that because nobody in their right mind is giving up, you know, any amount of land for $24 at any point in time in American history. And yet and still we keep telling that same one over and over again. Um, but this is really the, the idea that starts all of that off. Um, and it's the one that we have to constantly keep trying to fight against in order to tell it in a better light because Without that, it's hard to question everything else. And we also have to understand like there's a reason why we keep telling Thanksgiving and keep telling all these different indigenous stories and, and, and European stories the way that we do. And it's because, you know, they don't want people to ask questions. They don't want students in their class to, to think of, 
you know, American history for as brutal and as bloody and as violent as it actually has been. Um, and in order to do that, again, it's either to keep reprinting the same story over and over again and to get these kids as young as they possibly can so you can start programming that into their head. Um, and we are at that same point in time now in our history where people are now beginning to get this like social and racial reckoning. And for a lot of people, like the first time they're hearing about any of these stories, they're 40 years old, they're 50 years old, they're 60 years old. And it's, it's, it's really damn late for them. Um, and so it's really important that, that we begin to, to really bust down these walls and to think of ways in which to tell these stories authentically and truthfully, because the information is out there. It, it's littered all across the internet. There are really great books that, that, that detail a lot of this information. The Smithsonian has a lot of great aspects to it. Um, and then even still, if you don't necessarily know and you want to find the truth, you know, go directly to the source. Go to indigenous folks and, and, and ask them about, you know, that day and what that day represents. Because I would imagine that most indigenous people would have a very different idea of, you know, that fourth Thursday in, in November. Um, and that part is important for people to be able to tell their own story. Yeah, we were talking about the indoctrination as young as possible. One of my sons actually almost got kicked out of his third grade class over this. And they made them watch this, you know, video about the first Thanksgiving. And then we're supposed to like, you know, basically regurgitate what they were told. And he refused to do that because he knew it wasn't true. And so I had to go, as I have to a lot, go to school and talk, deal with the teacher. Um, but the, I think the worst part was she thought I was insane when I told her, but he's right. She had never been told that this narrative is not true. which I find disturbing and a lot of other um, adjectives. But in any event, like these people are teaching. Well, first of all, if you can't, if you can't look this shit up and learn yourself, you're not qualified to teach. But um, even so in the in any event, I finally wore her down and she let him actually write an accurate essay and present it to the class which angered a lot of parents because he was very, he was very brutally honest and there was, you know, graphic details about heads on pikes outside of the village and things. But, um, but you know, they didn't take that out of the curriculum. No. They still and, teach and, the same thing to every subsequent year. And they won't. And, and, and your child, I'm glad that, that he was able to stand up and, and actually speak that truth. Imagine if every other kid learned that same truth and was able to stand up and, and, and fight for that same truth to be told, honestly. Like, that teacher in that school don't want to have to deal with, you know, hundreds of, of your child. They'd rather deal with one of your child and try to stamp out that truth as much as they possibly can and then keep the, keep the engine running. And even when it comes to elementary teachers that, that are tasked with teaching a multitude of different subjects um, in which they are really not a, a master of any, um, history is often the subject that gets taught the least in most elementary schools. And it's also the, the subject that gets, um, that they learn the most when teachers are actually going through their credential program. Um, they don't necessarily want them to, to learn that stuff. It's, re it's easy just to give them a book and tell them just to follow through the chapters and the sections and answer the questions and do the little handout and, and create the little um, projects and then go ahead and keep it moving. I mean, and it's, and, and, and our, our curriculum has been constantly overridden with, you know, bad history and in ways that are harmful to indigenous folks and to black folks and, and to, to many other marginalized groups as well. That's literally what I did like growing up for like all of my class, like all of my history classes, they were just read this chapter, do this assignment, turn it in, get it done, maybe have a project over it, but we never really had like discussions about anything. And like I knew a little bit of the history because like my hometown, like there's a very large like Choctaw population. And so I like would talk with them about it, but a lot of it I didn't learn until college or until I met summer. <laughs> it's just like stuff that was just never like taught to me and I never thought to like look it up because, you know, ignorant, but I'm trying my best to learn now. <laughs> My goal is to be as bad as the missionaries. I'm just going to go spread <laughs> the truth to everyone. <laughs> Whole new person. <laughs> so. 
I mean, it's, it's like, but imagine if we were able to be sort of like that that missionary group mm -hmm. of people that were able to go around from place to place, actually spreading truth and what that could actually do. Like, it, it in in a lot of parents in this country think of that idea and even like the aspects of like CRT or whatever is being bad because it's gonna make kids feel really bad about what they're learning and make their or make white kids especially feel bad about themselves. And it doesn't. Like again, I've been doing this work for like twenty years and I've never had a kid walk out of my class feeling bad about themselves for learning the truth about history. Like, if anything, they're, they're, they're more pissed off about the idea that they never learned it than anything else. And that's something that they can take home to their parents, their aunts, their uncles, other home adults, their grandparents in a lot of cases. And that's when they can start having these conversations at the dinner table that lead to, to them being able to teach, you know, people around them that are much older. And in a lot of ways, like, think about how empowering that is. And uh, one of the things that as, as we continuously talk about these stories, whether it's Columbus, Thanksgiving, whether we're talking about like Pocahontas and, and, and even, even that, I always try to leave my students with the idea of how they can imagine things could have been different. What would have happened? What could have happened on this continent and on this land if Europeans came across the Atlantic Ocean authentically wanting to learn and grow and... and and, you know, experience what life was like here instead of actually trying to take resources away. If they didn't want to create, if they didn't want to, uh, you know, create capitalism and genocide and um, colonialism and enslavement, what if they'd actually come here with the idea of wanting to learn and to grow and to teach as well? And how much different things on this continent could have actually been? And that's right. one thing that I like to give them because it's important for them to, to understand that, like, history didn't have to happen the way that it did. Right, they could have been like the other groups before them. It's not like, because that's the thing a lot of people don't seem to understand or believe me when I tell them, Columbus was not the first European here. There's ample evidence of trade with lots of people, with the, you know, the Vikings on the East Coast. There's artifacts um, all along the West Coast from, uh, you know, the coastal regions of Asia. Columbus wasn't the first one here. He was just the first one who chose to exploit everything. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it's also important to understand that, like, colonial Englishmen have to tell these, you know, benevolent stories because they've only got a few of them they can even begin to put in a positive light, which is why when it comes to the English and their interactions with indigenous folks, the only ones that we ever really hear of is we hear of Jamestown with Pocahontas, and we hear about Thanksgiving, and that is it. And that's because those are the only two that they can even closely resemble the idea that they were not um, violent. And even still, like, we know the truth about Pocahontas. We know the truth about John Smith. We know the truth about John Rolfe. And, and, and the truth is out there about the first Thanksgiving that, um, that showed that, that those are patently falsely lies. Mm -hmm. um, but it's yes. like, if you have to lie about those, like, what else are you lying about? I mean, Pocahontas was kidnapped and... She was basically the first sex tra trafficking victim on this continent. But, uh, well, maybe not the first, but the first we know about. Yeah, the first documented um, in, in history. The first yeah. documented, right. I'm sure there were others. But, yeah, saying, you know, Disney. Yeah, we don't, wa we don't watch that movie in my house because of that. Yep, no. <laughs> you know, it's actually, I mean, there, there's times that, like, I've actually shown that movie to my history class as well. And, and it's not because it's supposed to be a great movie, but it's hopefully to show them, you know, what the media can do and how you can spin a story. And then we go out there and actually find the truth about Pocahontas. And the truth that we're able to find is really easy and really apparent. So it's like, if you're 12 or 13 or 14 years old and you can look up the stuff and find this information in one class period, you're trying to tell them that Disney couldn't? Or was it that not oh, the fact that you. Disney couldn't or the fact that they just wouldn't do it? Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. and it's... it's it's definitely that they wouldn't because there have been other stories I, I don't know about during that one. I'm sure there were people informing them at that time, but I know the ones they have made, including indigenous folks, since I've been an adult, there was plenty of us telling them <laughs> what was yeah. wrong with what they were doing. And they told us in no uncertain terms, they did not care. So yeah. money. Exactly. And they're willing to make that money and uh, deny the truth. Um, at every step that they possibly can. And then when they get caught with it, then they backpedal and um, figure out something else to do. And they know that, like, eventually, you know, another story will pop up for them to go ahead and, and you know, appropriate and take on. And people will go out there and spend the money to go ahead and watch it. Because uh, most people would rather have a history that is very 
neat and, and tightly wrapped up and in a bow that makes people feel really good about themselves. And when we say people feeling really good about themselves, we're talking about white folks because all these stories that are tied up in a nice little bow for them, um, you know, are harmful and destructive and violent for the rest of us. Yeah, but remember, we're not people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're, mean, we're costumed and shit. We're capital. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly what I we mean, are. I mean, if you read the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, we're not people, right? No. At least not, not at whole all. people. You know, there's that whole <laughs> fraction thing that happens, but. It's never made sense. I, I don't. I tell you, my kid had a, a, a history. <laughs> lesson the other day and the, the it was a multiple choice question and it was like you know which one of these it, did the constitution um establish or something like that and the option they wanted you to choose was all men are created equal and so then we had to have the whole conversation i'm like oh yes all white men that own property <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not and, and, the and, rest of us counted. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's really what it meant. And it's only been over the last, what, 100 years that they've decided to try to change that language in the, do in the document to make it seem as if they really meant everybody. And it's like, no, they didn't. And it's trash that you're even trying to do that now. Like, just admit that that's not what they were talking about and that that's not anything close to what they meant. And that when Thomas Jefferson wrote that, he literally meant that all land-owning men, white men that lived here in the, in the, in the Americas, were equal to all white land owning men that lived in Britain. And that was literally it. Didn't talk about women, didn't talk about indigenous, didn't talk about black folks, didn't talk about any, didn't talk about poor folks. So like, even when I, even when I give them that idea in class, like most of the kids that are in my classes, even though I teach at a private school, wouldn't fit into the class of, you know, land owning, you know, land owning white men. I mean, they just wouldn't. So like, he's talking about like a select handful of people that may even be at our school, let alone within this classroom. So like, he wasn't talking about you, and he wasn't talking about you, and he wasn't talking about you. He was talking about a very select few, and it's uh, it's important that they understand that and know that. So, I think uh, the challenge we should give to everybody is now when you go to your Thanksgiving uh, <laughs> dinners with your families, you all should tell them the real story. It's you have, you, you have heard the truth now, you have to go educate. Yeah, and, and, and you really should. And, and to me, like Thanksgiving should not be about, you know, a, a holiday to celebrate the, the birth of, you know, America and this, you know, friendly feast between indigenous folks and pilgrims. Like if you want to have that dinner, like you should be celebrating being able to, to be fortunate enough to have dinner with your friends or family or people that you consider that close. Um, but that should be about it. It shouldn't be about like reliving history and it shouldn't be about the pilgrims at all because, you know, honestly, they, they don't deserve that shit. And uh, we shouldn't keep propping it up the way that it is. That's why I really like like Friendsgiving. I like to celebrate like friendship and family and celebrating being able to like sit down and hang out for the day. Like that's what it is for me. It's what it's always been in my house. Like never talked about Thanksgiving, like ever. It's always been Turkey Day or just like we're gonna eat dinner today and everybody's gonna be here. Like it's it's stupid to celebrate something so horrible and tragic and awful. So I choose to do Friendsgiving. <laughs> I will be celebrating pumpkin pie. As you should. <laughs> there it is right there. <laughs> pumpkin Our pie is the number one pie. That is it. That is a hill that I'm willing to die on. Oh, oh no. after my own heart, I do love <laughs> some pumpkin pie. It's the perfect breakfast, by the way. It is. It's a good breakfast. I mean, I had cheesecake for breakfast the other day, and that was pretty good. But... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> I just got the picture of the Golden Girls in my head, you know, with them all the cheesecake when they're eating their feelings. <laughs> all right. Any final thoughts, y'all? Listen to me. I'm real country today. <laughs> hey, y'all. It's that Oklahoma in you. you know, <laughs> can't help it. Um, I would just say that, like, when it comes to Thanksgiving and, and celebrating it in the, in the next month or so, that it's important that we celebrate the friends and the, and the loved ones that we have. And that it's also important for us to, to talk about the authentic truth about that day. And learning about that doesn't make your turkey or your food or whatever you eat any less tasteful. And it doesn't mean that any time that you spend with your friends and family isn't less special. Um, there's room for both. You can learn about the, the true history of Thanksgiving and you can still have a decent day. And that part is important. 
can we also just mention how weird it is that people freak out about what food you eat on Turkey Day because they're like, this is what the pilgrims, no, pilgrims didn't have pumpkin pie and dressing. Why are you yelling at me about this? Yeah, no turkey. They ate lobster and uh, fowl and eel and a bunch of other. Some of that stuff is pretty disgusting. But yeah, most yeah. of the stuff that they had on their on their table was not stuff that we put on ours. Yeah, no, absolutely not. It's just and, weird. and I promise you, they didn't have domesticated turkeys. They had wild turkeys. They was, will not feed everybody. Okay, I've cooked plenty of them in my life. <laughs> They're not, not all big and plump, no? No, you are, you are not feeding the whole family <laughs> off one damn turkey, I promise. <laughs> we have, like, I don't know. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to you talk about it and learning new things. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>